why James Harden and the Nets won't win an NBA title. Because he was tired of not being the guy. I don't know about you, but this seems like a recipe for disaster. When the news came this past week of Houston Rockets superstar James Harden being traded to Brooklyn, it seemed as though the entire world immediately pegged them as the favorites to win the NBA title. What did you learn from that one game alone about Harden's arrival? Well, I learned that the Brooklyn Nets are going to the NBA Finals, mm. with or without Kyrie Irving. With a trio of Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving and James Harden, it's easy to see why many people are getting excited thinking about the limitless scoring options and highlight plays they'll surely provide. That's if Kyrie actually plays, of course. But how realistic is it for this team that in the first year of coming together, with a head coach in his first year of coaching and limited depth on the roster, that they'll truly contend for an NBA championship? There are many reasons why you might think this team has the best chance of winning. Lights out scoring. Whip it out for Durant. Fade. Elite ball handlers. Irving. Handles, fade away, Got Next level vision and passing. Harden goes behind the back, green straight away. And at one point in each of their careers, they were the best player on the planet. But ignoring for a moment all of the somewhat obvious reasons why many people have titled them as favorites, we're going to have a look why I believe they will not win an NBA title. In this video, I'll explain why they won't win a title by looking at five different things. One, their style of play. Two, their depth. Three, their coach. Four, their team chemistry. And finally, five, their experience. Be sure to stay to the end as I'll be announcing our next two videos coming out this week. And as always, be sure to give us a like and subscribe if you like the content. Let's get into it. Right down the middle. Style of play. All three of these players have proven to be elite scoring options, as both Durant and Harden have averaged 30 plus points per game in multiple years of their careers. And all three are coming off seasons where they averaged at least 27.4 points per game. They've all also led a team before and have gone on to take those teams to conference championships. When breaking down their styles of play, it may seem at first as if they have the perfect formula. A passed first, ankle breaking point guard, a seven-foot wing player who can shoot from anywhere on the floor, and another wing player who probably has the deadliest step back in the game and on any given night can drop 50 on your head. However, one common theme for all three of them is that they're extremely ball-dominant players and they rely heavily on one-on-one -on -one scenarios to get their shot off. Durant less so as he has the natural ability to catch and shoot. Durant. Bottom up post up on the block. Defensive board. Durant shoots over. Durant Space the floor. Talked about him playing all five positions as you run the fast break and stuff like that. Whereas both Kyrie and Harden generally need to have the ball in their hands to make a play, whether it be passing or scoring. They're primarily ISO ball players and aren't the same players when required to play off the ball. Though both Kyrie with 6.4 assists per game in the 2019-20 season and Harden with 7.5 have high assist totals over the course of their careers. The majority of these plays were designed to generate flashy assists and just pad the stats. As not all assists are created equal, many of their passes were not the best basketball play, but rather were simply performed to help build each player's resume. Therefore, stats can be deceiving, and so though they're both notorious for their ability to pass the ball, it's also important to understand that though all of the passes look nice, especially on the stat sheet, it doesn't mean that it was the smartest or best basketball play available at that time. So when putting together this collection of players who dominate the ball and rely on it to have a good name, they're likely going to be games where this becomes problematic. And come playoff time, if they don't find a system figured out, the ball's going to remain stagnant, players will get frustrated, and opponents will take advantage. Depth. Now, this one's somewhat obvious. But how many times have we seen collections of talent come together only to have to rely on the seventh or eighth best player to make a play in crunch time? When you get into the postseason, depth becomes extremely important as by this time you've already played 82 games or 72 for COVID season and the chances are that all of your players, primarily your stars, are beginning to get tired. And as you progress through the playoffs, you're going to be relying more and more on these stars, which is going to take more and more energy out of them. In this instance, if you don't have adequate backups to take the reins for the three to five minutes that your superstars are resting, you're basically screwed. If you look at the history of any championship team, they have depth. 
last year's Lakers. Sure, they had LeBron and AD, but they also had key role players like Danny Green, Dwight Howard, M. Morris, and Rajon Rondo. If you look at the previous champions, the Toronto Raptors, yeah, they went out and acquired Kawhi and already had Lowry, but they also had big time players like Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Fleet, Serge Ibaka, Marc Gasol, and Norman Powell. The point is, every team, no matter how great, needs supporting talent around them to win an NBA championship, as there are going to be times where your stars get tired, go cold, get shut down, or even potentially get injured. And if you don't have a plan in place when that happens, you've got no chance of winning a title. And I understand the coach. Coaching matters in the NBA, and it's potentially one of the most undervalued aspects of a winning franchise. For example, looking at the past champions from the last decade, every single team that's won has had a coach who's also won or has experience of coaching at other levels, whether it's NCAA, D League, or as an NBA assistant. However, Steve Nash has never won a championship as a player or as a coach, and his only coaching experience comes from being a part time consultant with the Warriors from 2015 to 2018. Now, I love Steve Nash, and I know that one of his biggest strengths as a player was his basketball IQ. And while he was only a consultant for the Warriors, the first year he hopped on, they went 73-9. and He certainly has the potential to make a big impact on this team going forward, but I find it hard to believe that a brand new head coach with no prior coaching experience and a team full of ego will have success. Chemistry. Potentially, the biggest problem I see with this team is the amount of ego that will surely flood the locker room. None of these guys, Harden, KD and Kyrie we're talking about, have ever been on a team and not had it be their team. When Harden was in Houston, unquestionably it was his team. And while he did play as the third fiddle in OKC, that was early in his career and it was a large part of why he ultimately left and went to Houston. When KD was in OKC and then Golden State, it was his team. Though some still thought it was Steph's team, but when Durant got there, he became the guy on a nightly basis and was the reason why they won as much as they did. And Kyrie literally left Cleveland and Boston because he was tired of not being the guy. I don't know about you, but this seems like a recipe for disaster. It's one thing to ask KD or Kyrie or Harden to be the second option on any given night. But now try asking one of these players if they're okay with being the third option. Two previous league MVPs and a finals MVP, they all want the ball in their hands with the game on the line, which may not be a bad thing, but having them try to decide who that should be is going to be difficult. I think that's asking a lot from any of these three players who are all coming from a situation where they're being relied upon day in and day out. Experience. When I mention experience here, I'm not talking about the big three, because literally all of them have years of experience playing in and winning big time games. However, tying into my previous point, they do have teammates and a coach who have never been there before and unfortunately, they're going to have to rely on these players at times in the playoffs. Hence why role players are so important. You need them to help take the stress off the stars when the postseason rolls around. When the Raptors went out and acquired Marc Gasol at the trade deadline, he barely played the rest of the regular season. But as soon as the playoffs hit, he took over as their number one big man for the team and played a huge role in their championship run. If you don't surround yourself with players who've been there before, they're likely going to freeze in the moment and make mistakes. For the Lakers last season, Rajon Rondo played a relatively minimal role in the regular season, but come playoff time, he was their primary ball handler outside of LeBron, and he eclipsed guys who'd been more relevant during the regular season. There are certain players who have playoff experience and won't panic in the moment. They've played at the pinnacle of success, and they know what it takes to win big-time playoff games. If you look at any championship team in NBA history, They've had a plethora of role players who not only have NBA experience, but NBA playoff experience as well. The Nets right now don't have anyone on their team outside of the big three who's ever even been to an NBA Finals. Conclusion. All in all, we can simply join the herd and list all of the ways as to why the Brooklyn Nets are the most talented team in the NBA. But you've got to ask yourself, is talent everything? How much does having the most talented roster in the league really matter? When you take into consideration all of the points I've mentioned throughout this video, you begin to see why there's so much more that goes into winning an NBA championship. Thanks a lot for staying to the end of the video. As promised, here are the titles of the next two videos for Hoop Nation. Number one, what makes Anthony Edwards so hard to guard? And number two, who's the most average NBA player in the league? See you then.